All right. Well, good afternoon, everybody. My name is Rusty Bland. I'm standing in for Ken O'Brien, who can't be here today. I'm the vice chair of the executive council. And I know we have a EC members here. Could you just stand up as we get going, just so we could recognize some of the EC leaders? There we go, clustered together. Thank you, guys. Um, so as uh, Jeff mentioned, and maybe uh, your campuses mentioned, uh, today is our church family meeting. We have our annual meeting coming up in August, but today we get a chance to just give you some preview and, and connect in, and we've got uh, a really great agenda. Um, so just welcome. It does feel like family time, so I want to just encourage all of us to feel that way. We'll have a Q&A at the end, and so uh, feel encouraged and welcome, like we're in a family. That's what we are, um, to stand up and ask the questions that you have. The, the, the goal is really some information. You're going to see more data coming your way. But then what I, what I don't want us to miss is the inspiration. This is a time to be reminded about what God is doing. And so it's clearly um, on all of us to enter into that as we're hearing the data and seeing what God's doing, how he's moving. Um, and isn't it great to just be able to do this together, by the way? I mean, last year, we were several of us were up here on being videoed, and it was, we had people texting in and emailing, and it was just, it was fine, but it was not great. <laughs> so it's just good to see people and, and be able to hug you and, and not feel like you're breaking some law as we're doing that. So it's great to be here. Um, I want to also just say how grateful I am for the staff and for the leadership of this, um, this community of faith. I've had the opportunity, a lot of the EC members, to see behind the scenes the kind of rigor and prudence and not fear, but really trying to keep people safe and to do the right thing through this last year. We've had a year unlike anything that we, any of us have lived through, frankly. And to see how they've responded and how they stayed unified and how, above all, they pointed us to Jesus is just, for me, um, a just a pleasure to see. And I want to convey that. If you haven't seen that or if you're not able to witness some of the behind the scenes. It's been happening in spades. And so just so, uh, yeah, thank you. These guys are amazing. Um, just that we're, and, and, and really, um, as, we, as we get into the business sec segment, if you will, we start hearing updates. Let's also be reminded that we're, we are on mission. Um, I, for one, and maybe you're reading a lot about the church and the state of the church worldwide. Um, Outside of the borders of America, the church is thriving. And, and fr frankly, as I talk to people that are in those places, they're looking at the U.S. and going, you guys are crazy right now. Like, it's a crazy place. And it can be discouraging. But frankly, what I see here is an exception to what's happening. Is we're, There's some amazing things that God is doing in our midst. And he's inviting you and me. Somehow, the God of the universe is inviting us in to be a part of that. And it's a mission and so, again, be inspired, but also kind of feel like we're getting charged up here because the world needs us, and God's calling us to some amazing stuff. So um, grateful that we can be in the series, even in Revelation right now, where we, we're understanding these letters that Jesus, um, through John, wrote to the churches. Very relevant to us. So let's make sure we keep our first love Let's make sure um, that we remain faithful and humble. And as, um, as we heard even from Revelation 2 today, let's not, let's not lose heart in the midst of struggles and hardship. Let's see that as God's way of perfecting us, um, which is his goal for us. So the agenda today, um, we're going to hear from Jeff right away. He's going to talk a little bit about uh, some updates and um, bringing some, some needed information to us. And then the campus pastors. We're hoping that Sterling is in the room. Here he is. All right, we were waiting for you, bud. So yeah, awesome, he's here. So the campus pastors are coming up. They'll come up and give us an update. Um, John Bechtel is going to come up and I think bring some of his staff to give some general ministry updates. Of course, Abe with the financials to share uh, what's going on there. And then Jeff will come back up to share vision. So question and answer at the end. So make your notes, and, and we'll certainly, we want to get to any of the questions you have. Uh, with that, let me just pray for, before Jeff comes up, and then we'll get started. Heavenly Father, God, we are just um, your people coming before you this morning grateful. Uh, we, we love your church, 
We love how Jesus has his plan to redeem the world, and it's us. And we're gathered together um, as broken people that are longing to see broken people come to know Jesus in a personal way. So we just thank you for the way that you set up the church, the beauty of it, uh, and, and the bride that she is. God, I pray that we would be faithful um, in the days ahead as more and more amazing things are in your heart to do through us here at Chapel Street. So help us to, to stay humble, help us to be available above all things, and just to, to reflect back the glory that you um, want to actually reflect back through us. And so be with us during these meetings. God bless Jeff as he's about to come up, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Rusty. Uh, let me add my thanks to all of our executive council members, um, Ken O'Brien, who has, if you don't know, our church chairman, Ken and O'Brien and his wife, Rhonda, have moved to outside of Denver. They're, they're in Castle Rock, Colorado. He'll come back for the annual meeting so we can have a nice roast of Ken O'Brien. No, only kidding, to honor him appropriately and deservedly. But they have moved, uh, and we'll miss them terribly. But uh, uh, for all of our executive council members, Rusty said some kind words about our staff, and I echo that. Our staff's been fantastic leading through a very difficult season, challenging season, but I also relied heavily on the prayers, encouragement, guidance, and support of Executive Council, and very grateful for them. We met far more frequently than some of them who came on board. We sort of, oh, it's, it's, you know, it's a couple times a year, and then the annual meeting. We were meeting, Zooming meetings, and almost uh, bi-monthly at one period just to make decisions in real time, and we're very, very grateful for their support and input. Um, uh, I want to tell you a quick story that happened just today. Um, I shared with somebody in the lobby a moment ago. God is on the move, and sometimes um, we're going to get into some numbers, and those numbers represent real lives. One of those real lives, let me just tell you about. I was uh, between services, the 9 o'clock and the 10.30 here at the Kesslinger campus. We had outdoor services. And a young man was with his... He, he, I, I saw him walk in, carrying chairs, three little girls and wife in tow. And I said, hello, and, and greeted them, but I didn't know them. But... I act like I know everybody, so maybe he knew me. I wasn't sure. He hung around after the service. He came up to me, and he said, um, hey, I, I, we're new here. It's our first time. I said, oh, really? That's great. How'd you hear about the church? He goes, well, actually, some friends recommended it to us. I was at Camp Paradise with my daughter, and it was your son, Tim, uh, uh, your son, Tim, that was there with him with your granddaughter, and they connected and didn't know him, but both were the same camp with their daughters and realized they live in the same community and come to our church, and he did. And then he said, do you remember me? And I said, no, I, I don't think we've met. He goes, we have. I was 12. I said, what? Oh, of course I remember you. No, I said, <laughs> he said, I was at Camp Paradise as a 12-year-old kid, and I worked at Willow Creek at the time as a youth pastor. I was probably 25 years old, 26 years old. And he said, uh, my dad had left the family. Um, parents gone through a divorce, and I was really struggling. To, and, in a, and you prayed with me and encouraged me. And he goes, that was the summer I gave my life to Jesus. 12 years old. Didn't know I was the pastor at this church. Just trusted a man he met at Camp Paradise with his daughter, father-daughter week, to come to a new church home. And then sees me, a guy he hasn't seen since he was 12, preaching. How, how amazing is God that he would connect all those dots? They're looking for a new church home. I, I was uh, weeping and so grateful to hear that story and amazed at how God does these things. And so God's on the move in our midst in, in many, many ways, as you know, and you're all evidence of that. Uh, just before we get into the agenda and bring up some of the campus pastors and tell you what's happening, the reason we do church family meetings is, uh, you know, typically churches, uh, not typically, but many churches have the meetings they're supposed to have and, and no more. We started doing these back when, we, when Pastor Brian and I were announcing and, and praying about the transition. Some of you might remember this. And we started having a series of meetings talking about the transition. And it was such a good feeling to be together as a church talking about even challenging things that we thought we should always be doing these. Not always, but we should be doing these periodically throughout the year. And so that's our intent, to have three to four additional church family meetings throughout the year, uh, in addition to the annual meeting, which we are required to have, just to talk. Let you know what we're thinking about, praying about, hear from you, tell you what God's doing, tell you what the challenges we're facing, celebrate the good things. And so that's the intent that we stay a church family, which is um, more challenging to do, stay a church family as we grow. We say that we want to be, be a family of neighborhood churches. Some of you are familiar with the, the phrase, the multi-site church movement. And by definition, we are a multi-site church because we have multiple sites. Duh. But actually, 
typically the multi-site church is, is some of you will know this, is uh, there, it's video teaching predominantly. It's a campus pastor who's really kind of a, a manager of that location, but it's, it feels the same everywhere you go. Uh, we're taking a different approach, and I'm not telling you things you don't know, but it's good to, to restate the vision and the, and the mission here. And really, we're, we're closer to what you might call multi-congregational. The phrase we use is a family of neighborhood churches. Families share a history, they share DNA, they share a, a connection uh, uh, to each other and support, but they're not clones. They're not the same. So each individual campus or congregation is meant to be an expression of the gospel in that context. With live preaching, people, uh, now we share some of the healthy things that we do, infrastructure, resources, leadership, central services, you'll hear about all that. But just to remind you, we're not trying to be a multi-site movement like some of you might be familiar with. We're trying to be, by God's grace and for his glory, a family of neighborhood churches. And so toward that end, we really think, rather than me just tell you in broad brush strokes what's happening, you should hear from uh, the, those people who are leading our different congregations uh, where they are and those that are to come. And we also, by the way, you'll hear about this, think of our online community increasingly as one of our campuses or a congregation, if you will. There are many of you stay connected to us online because it's convenient when you travel, and that's wonderful. But there are many people, and you'll hear about this, who worship exclusively online who don't live in this area, and that's also wonderful. And you'll hear from Pastor Stetson uh, in a few moments about that. We, uh, uh, just to tell the story I've told many times before, but it's, it's, it's just an encouraging thing to think about how God goes before us we had never streamed or pre-recorded or had a service online of any kind prior to COVID. We would post the audio and video the next week from that week. I, for years, thought this is going to encourage people to stay home. And then I had some friends who were pastors saying, hey, dingling, they're already staying home. <laughs> you know? This will keep them connected when they travel, when they're not here. And those who want to check you out are going to try to do so online. And so uh, we have made the strategic decision prior to COVID to invest in the, the tech resources, the equipment, and the training and staffing to ramp up to, to broadcast or to stream a service at Easter of 2019? It was 19 or 20? 19. 20. 2000. I can't remember. Did, did anybody else have trouble with dates from COVID? Like, I don't know what, what happened when anymore. It's a blur. So Easter of 2020 was going to be our first streaming service ever. Well... We know it happened early March of 2020. The whole world went crazy, and everything shut down. And so we ramped up to do it just a month early. I shudder to think what we would have done had we not made the, had God not led us to invest in those things prior to COVID. He, was, he knew what was going to happen, and he prepared us to be ready for what was going to happen. Now, I do not believe, we do not believe that, that online worship is ever a substitute for in-person fellowship, for face-to-face -face community. It is a supplement to that. But for many people who can't be here or choose not to be here and, or, or don't live in the area, it's a resource that God is clearly using. So I just want to celebrate that with you, that we stumbled into some things uh, that we would not have otherwise and that God prepared for us in advance to do. So without further ado, I would like you to, uh, just to hear a short update from our campus pastors about what God is doing, the challenges they're facing. Um, in broad brush, we are uh, in-person services right now um, across the board. Abe, if I get this wrong, correct me. About 60 to 65% in our attendance numbers of pre-COVID attendance. So that's not counting online. In-person attendance is about 60 to 65% of what it was before COVID, which is pretty healthy nationwide considering some churches aren't even at 50% yet, depending on the region you're in and so on. Uh, some of that is offset because some people have just chosen to stay online. Uh, but we also, our online numbers, if you add those together, with the, the, we, we know that our church is growing based on new givers and new attenders and new connections, even though the old ways of counting uh, don't seem to mean the same things anymore. So we are in the process as staff of relearning what are the metrics we should be paying attention to in addition to in-person attendance and generosity. And we'll talk more about that in a minute. So uh, without further ado, let me bring up Pastor Sterling Moore. Sterling Moore, everybody! You can talk to us about Mill Creek who just got back from vacation yeah. celebrating his wife's birthday. You look like you're relaxed. I, uh, I was just commenting how um, all the like bandwidth that you gain by being on vacation and sitting on the beach, somehow the drive home seems to empty instantaneously. Like somewhere on I-65 last night late, uh, I, hit, I hit empty. But it is good to be with you. And um, just wanted to share a couple updates with you regarding the Mill Creek campus. 
Uh, you've heard me say before, uh, these, this last 18 months was, was a challenge in a variety of ways throughout Chapel Street as a whole. Certainly that was true for us at the Mill Creek campus as we tried to think of ways to maintain campus identity but all be together at the same time and how do we effectively do that and what does that look like. Well, this season that we're in right now, uh, as my staff and I prayed through um, the needs of the congregation, as, as Jeff said, we're kind of multi-congregational, where our families are at and what they need, really the word that um, kept coming to the surface was this needed to be a season of reconnection. And so that has been our objective over this last month and a half or so. Um, our goals and our objectives has been to, to care for and to reconnect with our church family. One of the things that we discovered is that this uh, previous season has affected us all in a lot of different ways, myself included, but that was true for each of these individual families. So we recognized there was a lot of um, grief, a, a lot of uh, pain that people had experienced for a whole variety of reasons. And so what we're really kind of focused on right now is trying to care well for our people uh, part of that has been our, our efforts, as you know, throughout the church to make individual calls to families to check in, to pray with them. Um, this summer, uh, we're doing something we call uh, Second Sundays, which uh, last Sunday, due to the weather, it was pushed back to Third Sunday. So once a month, we, we are just gathering together after the service for community. No real objective other than being with other people, talking and catching up. And, and trying to normalize that, as crazy as that sounds, it has been so necessary for, for our congregation. And so uh, the reason I was late is because after service today, there was an ice cream truck sitting out there. And we just, we just had ice cream together. Um, and uh, each and every week, um, we are seeing new people. It, it, one of the things that has been both exciting and challenging is, as a pastor you're looking across the room and you're like, wow, I haven't seen this person or I wonder where they're at or I wonder what's the story here. And at the same time, you're looking across the room and saying, this is the first time I've ever seen this family or there's brand new. So the Lord is, is really doing some incredible things. Right now, I would say almost every single Sunday, I meet somebody new that this, this season has exposed a need for them. And, and they're exploring, and they're trying out the church to see if there's, if there's something here that speaks into that. And, of course, we believe we have, we have something to offer in that regards. At the same time, um, we are also replenishing our serving teams. Um, some people moved away over the last 18 months. As Pastor Jeff said, others are, we're, are just not back yet. They're not comfortable yet. So God is also now raising up this new group of servants to serve our kids and to serve as ushers and to be on our welcome team. And, um, and that is exciting for us. Um, people are using their gifts in new and profound ways. And, and so this is, you know, I've, I don't know if this is the right word for us at the Mill Creek campus. Maybe it is, but it has felt like a season of relaunch. 2017 in the fall, a group of us went out there but the, the sending and the blessing of Chapel Street to launch a campus, launch a congregation in the Mill Creek community. And this last few months has felt like a relaunch, reigniting around the vision, reigniting about what it means to be a neighborhood church, and then mobilizing God's people around that vision and towards that end for his glory. Um, and so that's, that's really been our focus. We've been also reengaging in the community um, about every other week or so, we, there's a local couple in the Mill Creek neighborhood who owns a small coffee cart. And so we, we hire them to show up at a park, and eight to ten of us will show up in our chapel sheet shirts and just connect with families that are there and the kids. Uh, they're playing with their kids in the park and, and have a cup of coffee with them. Pay for their cup of coffee, get the kids some lemonade, and just, just be with people. So that really is our area of focus. We're excited um, really feel like we're building to kind of a, a, in the fall, just a full steam ahead kind of, of mode as we care for our people and we reignite around the, the vision. So that's what's going on at Mill Creek. Who's up? Andrew? Andrew Griffiths, ladies and gentlemen. 
I don't have quite as cool of a haircut as uh, Sterling Moore, which always makes me sad when I have to follow him. Um, but I, uh, I just want to share a Bible verse just as I start to share a little bit about our North Aurora campus, which this is our first family meeting where our discussion about North Aurora is more than just an idea. There's a group of people attached to it. There's a family. There's a congregation. Uh, so personally for me, it's, it's a very exciting time just to be here and seeing God having brought about uh, this thing that he put on all of our hearts a while ago. But I want to I share this verse really quickly from the letter of Colossians, where uh, this is what Paul says. He says, we always thank God the Father for our Lord Jesus Christ when we pray for you, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world and is bearing fruit and increasing. And that last little phrase I have been reflecting on as I think about where we as a church are together, that the word of truth, the gospel is bearing fruit and it's increasing. I think it's a remarkable thing that just as Rusty mentioned at the outset of the meeting that uh, in a country, in a culture where not every church is doing great, God has been so faithful and generous and kind to sustain us as a church family, to grow us as a church family. And North Aurora is a testament to the fact that the gospel is bearing fruit, that it's increasing. So uh, it's my pleasure today to tell you a little bit about what is happening, uh, especially in the coming months, and ask for you to pray for us. Uh, so if you're not aware, the, the launch team for the North Aurora campus has come together, and we have about 70 adults and about 30 kids. So a team of about 100 right now. There are spots for more. If you are interested, we'd love to chat with you about it. But that launch team is a group of families here from Chapel Street that is intergenerational. We have families that are on the older side. We have families that are on the younger side. Uh, it's kind of a blend of all of our campuses. We have families from South Street, from Mill Creek, from Kesslingham. We have families from the original group of uh, people that were at Cornerstone community as well. So it's this beautiful team that God has started to put together that represents who we are as Chapel Street uh, and all the different parts that make us unique. And uh, kind of our goal in these months leading up to September is to uh, build unity together as a team. Uh, and so we have, uh, starting back in uh, March, I believe, we started having monthly core team meetings where that group of people would gather together. We'd talk a little bit about how we were going to serve at the new church uh, and what our roles might be, as well as pray together for everything that's going to happen there. We also ran a rooted group in the spring, which was fantastic. If you haven't had a chance to do rooted yet, you're going to hear a little bit more about it later. and would encourage you to jump in however you can because it was such a blessing for our launch team to do that. Uh, we had a small group uh, of people just get to know each other really well, be able to st share what God's done in our lives and look forward together to what he might do. Uh, and so we're going to try and run two more rooted groups here in the fall once we actually get launched and open up our doors. Uh, construction at the North Aurora campus is coming along really well. We are very close to being complete. Uh, if you were to drive past uh, the church on Banbury Road in North Aurora, you'd see that most of the external stuff is already done. Uh, it looks like a brand new church ready to go. We're still waiting for a few things indoors, but our hope is to start meeting in the building uh, at the start of September as a launch team. Uh, so here in August, our launch team will be meeting at the South Street campus to worship together, to pray together, to hear God's word together. And then we will move into the building at the start of September. Uh, we will have a block party at the campus on the 19th of September as kind of a celebration of having moved into the neighborhood. Uh, and we will open our doors to the public at that time as well so that people can start coming uh, to get to know us and we can get to know them. But even as we look forward to that day and we can, we can kind of get in our minds that that's when North Aurora really will exist. Uh, and I would encourage you that that's a, that's a false way to think about it. North Aurora already exists now. There is a, a community of believers. We are already building relationships with people in that neighborhood. Uh, September is just going to be the day when we have a building. Um, but we know that the church is much more than a building. Uh, it's a people. It's something that we've learned together over the last year especially. Uh, and so I uh, would love for you to be praying for us in a couple of different ways. Uh, first of all, just for unity as a team, that we would continue to grow together, uh, that we would share our lives with one another, that we would support one another. Uh, I, I think I speak for the rest of the staff at North Aurora when I say that 
We don't want our launch team to just feel like they're plugging holes uh, in tasks that need to be done, but we want this to be a family effort together of growing God's kingdom. Uh, so please pray for unity. Pray for uh, our upcoming launch events, our block party in September. That's going to be a really big, significant event. It's something that Mill Creek did when they launched and was a huge part of their success early on. So we'd love for you to pray for us, that we would meet our neighbors, that we would serve our neighbors well, that we would make some really good connections there. Uh, and then also just pray for us that just as the building is coming up structurally, that God would be doing work in us spiritually. Because we see that building go up, uh, but again, we know that the people who are going to fill that building is where God's heart is really at. Uh, and so we, we need, I need, uh, and the kids team need, and the worship team all need our hearts to be right with the Lord. And so we'd love for you to pray for that for us, to encourage us. Uh, and just a, a quick update in case you don't know, uh, there will be four main staff members at Chapel Street North Aurora. I would be the campus pastor. Uh, our worship leader is Eric Robertson, who's also our tech director. You've seen him lead worship uh, sometimes here at Kesslinger. He looks exactly like me, and my wife sometimes thinks he is me. So that's not going to be great at the new church. <laughs> but, uh, and then we also have a kids director, Jen Lindsay, uh, who has been on staff with me for a while now, both kind of planning uh, this launch together. I've been really uh, grateful for her support and her input. She's a fantastically gifted kids leader. Uh, and then uh, we've just recently hired an admin for our campus, who's going to be Heather Roxworthy, who I'm really grateful for as well, brings a lot of talent to our team. But uh, there's all that still to come, a lot of work here in this next month to just get ready. Like I say, we'll be meeting uh, over at South Street to worship, uh, and then hopefully get commissioned together at our stadium service this year, and look forward to opening our doors in September. So uh, next up is Pastor Kenton. I get to represent South Street because Brian is away this weekend. He's uh, his son's marriage celebration, right? Kind of already been married. How many are South Street today? We win. Well, Brian and I love the opportunity to be able to lead at the South Street campus. And if you love traditional hymns that are deep in theology, accompanied by orchestra and choir and organ, we're the place for you. And uh, it's been a great joy since we opened up again to be able to worship God together, to watch attendance grow from that first Sunday when 23 people came back after, after the, uh, the uh, COVID stuff started to lift. It's been great to be able to watch the room fill up and hear people worship God. Um, also, we meet at 10 o'clock, so if you ever sleep in, come and check us out. Uh, some of the highlights that have been happening so far this year we actually, um, towards the end, before we opened up, started streaming traditional worship online. And we continue to do that. And we have people watching from all over the country. This morning it was, uh, it was in Florida and Wisconsin and some other places. So it's a great joy to be able to share traditional worship online. We've also uh, been able to um, have a volunteer orchestra that's finally started. And uh, if you play an orchestra instrument at all, we could use you but we're up uh, starting to use an orchestra to lead worship, which we're thrilled about. We're also looking forward to the choir starting back up this fall, and if you sing, we need you. And uh, that's another thing we're doing at South Street. We've had two people who have taken on the role of, of a care team who are gonna start caring for the congregation, and we really thank God for them. Also, Brian, myself, Laura Chavez is our children's worker, uh, helper, uh, director, and uh, Sarah Pavey is our organist. We're also looking for an administrator who would work for the South Street campus as well as with marriage ministry with Brian. So if you have any interest in that, the job description is at chapelstreet.church slash jobs. <laughs> Finally, we're excited to be able to continue to find ways to uh, allow our congregation to thrive and to grow. And one of the things is uh, Brian is very passionate about bringing coffee back. So uh, that's going to be something that at South Street we're going to start focusing on. So he's thrilled about that. Uh, we also um, consider sometimes South Street to be the, uh, one of the best kept secrets in the community. So if you know of folks who are looking for traditional worship for something that we have to offer, let folks know. Pass it around. If you come across someone who you know that would be something they would enjoy, please let them know that Chapel Street Church offers a variety of styles of worship one of them is traditional worship. Thanks. All right. Hi, everybody. 
My name is Stetson. I'm the pastor of, the on of online engagement, and I'm going to give you a little bit of a highlight of what's going on on our online campus. So um, online, we have, uh, on average, uh, over the past three months, about 600 views each week. So that's a, that's a really large, critical mass of views that are people that are watching our online service and engaging. And what we're seeing is that there's, there's not a lot of people, if we were to ask you to raise hands, which I won't, but ask you to, who, who attends the online service um, exclusively, it, it's very few because it's a few people see it as a, a campus that they're regular attending. Typically, people will only attend in, per in person. But um, a lot of people leverage the online service as a, as a place that provides a little bit of flexibility to stay connected, as Pastor Jeff was saying, to stay connected when you're on vacation, when you're sick at home, or some other reason why you can't attend in person, you can attend online. And what's really cool is that, um, is that people are checking out our online service uh, before they attend in person. So that is the audience that I'm most interested in addressing and that, and we are so poised at reaching those people and making a wide digital front door. So people can, can come in and experience our church for the first time at our online service and then have a positive experience, connect to others in the chat section, ask questions if they have them, and then attend at any one of our three, soon to be four campuses. And that's just like a beautiful connection point, a pathway for people to, to, to land in a, a God's Christ-centered community that is faithful to the Lord. So that's what I'm most excited about for the online service. And, and I know that's happening frequently. When we, we hear stories about that all the time. I'm going to share two of them. Um, one was uh, a guy named Scott who, uh, who lived in California and was still in California but was going to move over the next couple months. He attended our online service weekly for a period of months before he actually moved into the area. And because we, him and I were already connecting, I was able to pray for him during the move, uh, welcome him whenever he actually arrived here, and then greet him when he attended our newcomer gather when he was here in person. And at that point, it was, we had so much cool connection that it was, like a, it was like, hey, it was like seeing a friend, even though I'd never met him in person. Um, another one was uh, Michael Borg and his family. Is Michael here by chance? No? Um, anyway, Michael uh, and his family attended. He was a young dad with young kids, which I am as well. They lived in the city and were going to move into Geneva and wanted to find a church in the area. And so they were attending faithfully online for weeks, and we were able to connect. He, we were even praying for each other while, during, again, praying for each other during the move. He was praying for me because I had a shoulder injury. It was just a really sweet relationship, and when we were able to finally meet each other in person, it was like meeting a friend. It was just a great opportunity, and I love that we get to see uh, people connecting to the church in this way. So those are a couple moments. Now, what's really cool about this, those two stories, that was with me, but any one of those things could happen with you. You have the ability, just, and just as I do, to connect with people in the chat section, welcome them to the, to the church, invite them in the chats or some, somewhere during the online service, you could invite them to attend. Hey, I'm gonna be attending in person at our Mill Creek campus next week. I would love to see you there. Um, or you can, invite, you can invite a neighbor or somebody that you meet. Hey, check out my church. Here's a link to our online service. If you like it, I'd love to attend with you in person next week. It's a very easy way to invite people to church and I hope you'll take advantage of that. Stetson, um, is this a brand new role? One of the changes we made during COVID was to uh, move Stetson from the Director of Communications, which he came here to do, uh, and put him as the pastor of online engagement because we thought it really needed a pastoral leadership, and we're grateful for that. And so uh, we're, we're, some of you might be wondering like, what we do online. Early on, when we first started during COVID, we were in this room, and we would do the service to an empty room just like you were here and just record it, kind of one shot, hope it works and I can remember, we had, I, it was so stressful because <laughs> we had finished it. Did it work? Did we record? Because okay, we, we would stream it on Sunday morning in here in the room, and it was empty. And we realized this may not be the best practice because like, was, there's a lot of risk factor involved. If we get it wrong, the stream is broken. And so we started pre-recording it and then streaming it after, uh, uh, during the service time. Then we played around with doing it live in the room with, with a delay. Uh, so you'd be with actual people here, they started coming back. Then we started pre-recording and post-producing because it actually, I don't know if you know this, but, and I didn't know until we did this, 
when you stream like a, a music live from a room, it sounds way worse when it goes out into the airways and the internet because it's not it's not mixed for broadcast. There's a whole other thing involved in this, and so we would have somebody in the basement mixing it different. We've just been learning so much as we go. Right now, we are pre, most of the time pre-recording the worship and the sermon, post-producing them so they look and sound really good, and then stream that on Sunday morning. Occasionally, we broadcast live from the room, and we find people have lots of different preferences. Believe me, I've had lots of emails about this. Um, and we're trying to find what works best. What I can tell you is we're trying to find our way with best practice, but we do see God using it, and we're getting better every week. And Stetson oversees that whole process, guiding us in terms of what levers to pull when, so I'm really, really grateful for that as well. Um, you might notice we did not talk about Kesslinger as a campus. We really want to move toward having campus pastors who are overseeing the spiritual care, preaching, and health of their campus. And you've heard from each of them now. Um, for Kesslinger, I am the de facto campus pastor because I'm here most often, but we want to move as a church toward a place where we have a campus pastor here, and I'm really a pastor to the campus pastors and over the, the whole church family. We're not there yet. Um, the reason I bring this up is because I'm going to bring up John in just a moment to introduce some other of our staff members, but as it relates to pastoral care in our church family, um, we have a care ministries department. Do I see Julie Robertson here, and is John Hokiga here? He usually, John may not be here today. He's out of town at the moment. But John and Julie are, uh, lead our care department, and so they, you can chat with her later, they oversee many of specific issues of crisis intervention. They're working on a plan for a care team for every campus, um, and so they handle the, care, the specific care for grief and, and divorce care and support groups and that sort of thing. But if you have pastoral care needs... The most logical thing I see for people is that they call or make, try to email the person who they see most often or hear most often, which is me. And I love people. And I want to meet all those needs. I really do. I agonize over this. Uh, you can talk to Abe and John and Jenny. I struggle with this. Um, but I, it's impossible for me. I feel the burden and the weight of that. I can't possibly do it. And I'm disappointing people at a rate they cannot tolerate. <laughs> I heard a, a friend once say that leadership is disappointing people at a rate they can tolerate. Uh, so anyway, I realize that, that we, it's, it's, it's a challenge. So I um, have to have help in that way. So uh, what I want to say to you is if you, if you reach out to me for pastoral care, I will do my best to respond. But please know, if you, and this will probably happen, if you, it is suggested that you meet with Pastor John Bechtel or John Hookinga or any of other pastors, it is not because I don't care. It is not because I don't, uh, don't want to have time. It's because there just are limits. And I think part of my growth as a leader of this church is to recognize my limits and to realize I have to give my best efforts to what's most important, what God's called me to, uh, and, and we have other people who are better at that, quite frankly, and more available. So anyway, just wanted to say that uh, to all of you who might be wondering about that. Um, and we do want to move toward a day where we have a campus pastor at every campus uh, who's thinking about the health and growth of that campus alone. Toward that end, I'm going to bring up our executive pastor, John Bechtel, everybody. Woohoo! Thanks, Jeff. Hey, Rusty, thank you so much for recognizing the staff. I don't think they get the credit they deserve for, uh, for how they have been so faithful. I, my, my joke that wore out way too quickly in the middle of COVID is, hey, guys, you are, you are pivoting so much, you're pirouetting. And uh, they were uh, pirouetting and pirouetting and pirouetting. It's almost like they were running around that bat. Then all of a sudden, COVID, uh, everything opens up, and they're, they're shot out of a cannon. And there has been incredible ministry uh, since our doors have been opened back up. And I just, I just want to, there's so many things to highlight, but, but God has been at work, and our, and our staff have done an amazing job. We had an amazing VBS uh, a week where, where 91 uh, children profess faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what we're here for. Over $4,000 were raised uh, to give money to, to help people physically see better. Uh, the, the emphasis for our week, the focus was focus, focusing on Jesus. So we wanted to have a, an emphasis on helping people see better. Over $4,000 was raised. We had over 100 students go to the Twin Cities and, and made incredible impact and came back incredibly impacted by Jesus. And, the, and their spiritual walks, I think, have been changed forever. Uh, we've had incredible men's events and women's events. Uh, we've had power camp running where, where, where our, our neighborhood uh, kids are hearing about Jesus. God is on the move. I want to say that. He's working through our staff. And I also want to say thank you to you, the volunteers who made it happen. 
Um, God is uh, on the move, and, and we are being a church. We are making an impact. We're living out our vision. We're, help, we're making an impact. We're being for where, where we are, and, and our staff are leading that charge. Sterling mentioned that uh, one of the themes they were talking about was this idea of reconnection, of just reconnecting people. And I think that really, as I talk to all the, the ministry directors across the board, that is, is a major theme uh, for everyone. We're tricking out, f- trying to figure out how do we help people get reconnected. And uh, that's going to be an important thing, and we're going to ask for you to continue to, to step up, to step into a uh, relationship, and to step into uh, service. Those are going to be some important things for us to keep moving forward as a church. But um, there are so many different uh, departments we could highlight, but, but, but strategically, we thought it would be good to highlight a couple of different uh, departments that uh, really do help us reconnect. And so the, the first uh, department we'd like to highlight will be our, our women's uh, ministry team, and then our second will be our groups, uh, our groups team. And uh, for that, what, for, for women, so we're going to have Kristen Streepy, our director of Chapel Street Moms, come and give a highlight uh, for our women's, uh, women's ministry. And then after that, Joe Scavato, our associate pastor for groups, will come up and talk about our group life. So Kristen, you want to come on up? Hello, everybody. It is such an honor to be here on behalf of Chapel Street Women. Um, Lorene Coffey is our director of Chapel Street Women, but she is out of town with her husband celebrating their son's wedding, which happened earlier this year. But um, having a big party, basically, is what they're doing. Um, But I am so happy to be with you today just to share a little bit about what's been going on in Chapel Street Women and what's upcoming for the fall. So um, we've actually had a lot going on this summer. We are very excited to be able to meet again in person and talk to each other face to face as I think you've heard across the board. Um, and, and God is moving in all of that, but I want to just back up to this last year and just tell you how much God moved both in us as a staff and in the women that we serve throughout this whole past year. God didn't step away. He was absent, and he has been working um, in the lives of women and in our lives as we moved through this time. Um, having said that, we're very grateful that it seems to be at an end now <laughs> and that we have... We can meet together in person more and more. Um, Over the summer, I just want to share some of the stuff that we've had going on. Women's Bible study met through the month of June. We had over 110 women participate this summer. We had our outdoor activities, which this summer included women's walks. We had those about once a month. The last one just happened last week. And we had women from age 20 all the way through their 80s involved. And so um, I just love that ministry to see the different generations coming together just to walk. And I think they enjoy ice cream together at the end most of the time, too. So um, that's a draw. Um, This summer, we started a couple new things. One of them is our summer nights events, which we've been having about once a month. Our next one is coming up this Wednesday. And these have just been an evening to provide community, some time of connection and and fun together, and also an opportunity to listen to some teaching so that we can grow in our faith together as well. Um, So that's been really fun. We've had over 200 women participate in those two nights alone, and we're looking forward to seeing some new women um, who are registered to attend this week. We've been doing some park play dates in partnership with Chapel Street Kids, which has been really fun, where we um, expanded some of the play dates that they were already doing over at the Mill Creek campus, and we extended it into the Fox Valley community um, at several different parks around the area so that moms in those areas can have a place to go in their neighborhoods where they can gather with other moms who are from all the um, areas and just spend some time chatting with each other and letting their kids play. Um, so that's been a real blessing over the summer as well. Let's see. I have to refer to my notes because there's so much. Um, our gather groups have started meeting again, and we're really excited about that. They had to take a break because they meet in small groups in homes. So this is targets women in their 20s and 30s. It pairs them with some older mentors. Um, they gather together in homes in small groups. Usually they enjoy a meal, and they also learn some activity. So the last one, they learned how to arrange flowers, which I thought was really fun. Um, and I wish I was in my 20s so I could be one of those people who come and learn how to do this. Um, but that's been a really successful and growing ministry that started just before COVID, took a little break, and is now um, jumping right back in where they left off. 
Our senior single women has been doing bi-monthly themed luncheons with programs. Um, and that's, it. also they had to take a little break, but they have just started meeting again, and it's really just a beautiful ministry to, to minister to those women who are older and um, single and to give them a place of connection and community together. We also have some special interest groups. We have our knitting ministry, our scrapbook ministry, and our prayer ministry. Um, all of these surrounding different activities that women like to participate in and give them a place to get plugged in over something they enjoy doing together. So that's been a really wonderful um, opportunity for connection as well. I think I covered everything that's been <laughs> happening. <laughs> um, but forgive me if I forgot something. Um, in the fall, we're looking forward to just continuing all of that and just bringing, continue to ramp up to... Um, to offering everything that we used to and also maybe some more and some different ministries. So one thing, or I guess it's multiple things under one umbrella that's going to be starting up again in the fall, and that's our mom's ministries. So we have several different mom's ministries. The first is Moms Together. We minister to moms of young children. Next, we have Moms Connected, and that's for moms of teens and tweens. We have our college moms in prayer. You see how we're going with the age progression here. Um, that ministers to moms who have college-age children, regardless of whether they're actually attending college. And then we also have our single moms, which meets every other month for brunch and a program that's designed specifically for them and the needs that they have as single mothers. Um, I don't have a lot of numbers, but at College Moms in Prayer, we have over 120 women right now, so that's um, a really fantastic thing, and we're looking forward to um, getting our um, other moms' ministries started again in the fall. Moms Connected for Moms of Teens and Tweens starts up in September, and Moms Together for Moms of Young Children will start up again in October with in-person sessions and childcare, which is a wonderful, beautiful thing. Um, so as you can see, we just have a lot of things going on. We have a wide range of ministry, and our hope and our desire at Chapel Street Women is just to provide places for women to connect with each other, to provide them with support as women and as mothers in whatever stage that they find themselves in. We want to provide opportunities for people to enter the church, um, to feel comfortable in this community, regardless of their faith background. And we also want to provide opportunities for those who are established in their faith to continue growing and to continue to get to know our wonderful Lord and Savior. And so I think that we have um, covered the bases very well, and we continue to seek um, God's guidance in the ministries that we offer and the opportunities that we offer women. It's it's very exciting right now for Chapel Street Women as we um, ramp up and begin to go. And um, our staff, I speak on behalf of everyone, I think, when I say it's just such a privilege to serve this church and to serve the women of our communities together. So thank you. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Joe Scavato. I'm the... <laughs> I should have known. Uh, I am the associate pastor of groups here at the church, and uh, it's just been quite a year for the groups team, and I've seen God do so many things. Um, you know, as a, as a team, we've been talking a lot this past year um, of just one of the things that has just been taught or, or maybe clarified or reminded of um, this past year, which is the difference that it makes when you're living in community versus living in isolation. Um, you guys have probably seen some of the studies and the reports that they've shown uh, just the, the effects of your physical and mental and emotional health when we were all in lockdown and quarantine and, and how much it can be harmful. And the same thing is true uh, with our spiritual health, that we have been created to be in community. Um, and life groups and, and rooted in all the things that we have to offer, I think is a great opportunity um, to help meet that need. You know, last spring we had some of our life group leaders, which we have dozens of, of group leaders that are so faithful, and some of them are even here today. And, and if that's you, I'm so grateful for everything that you do to, to lead this church so well. Um, and back in the spring we met, and, and we were just kind of sharing stories of things that, that groups have gone through uh, in this COVID season. And some of the stories that they share were just amazing. Of, of walking through some of the highest of highs and the lowest of lows together. 
um, and how important it is to have people who know you, who, who you know, who are praying for you and growing in faith and growing in relationships and, and serving together. And there's just so much value to that. Um, and so if you are not involved in a group in some way, I really want to encourage you and invite you to consider that this fall. You know, it's, it's so important to worship in, in person or online, and, and all of that is great, but God does something really special when we meet in community, when we meet in small groups around a dinner table talking about the previous sermon or talking about a study or, or just talking about life, about your kids, about your family, about your job, and just having people that you know have your back. There's so much value to that. And so if you have not been involved in that way, or if you know someone who, who maybe needs to take that step, I want to encourage you to either come find me after this meeting or, or send us an email, reach out in some way, and get connected. Uh, we have life groups that we can get you connected in. But another thing that Andrew mentioned that I, I want to make sure I mention is our Rooted program. Uh, some of you might have gone through Rooted already, but if you haven't heard of it, it's a 10-week study, uh, and there, there are three purposes of Rooted, to connect you with God. God, to connect you with your purpose, and to connect you with the church. Um, and so it's a 10-week study where it goes through some of the fundamentals of the faith, but then also kind of getting into some of the really deep things about, you know, what do we do with suffering? What strongholds do I have? What is my purpose as a follower of Jesus? It's a really great thing. I've gone through it several times now, both as a participant and as a leader. And every time I do, there are people that are in the groups that maybe like some of you have been walking with Christ for a long time. And maybe when you hear the word fundamentals, you might think, oh, I know all that. I've got those down. But every time people come to me after the class and say, wow, that was different than anything I've ever done. That was so, so life-changing, so, so altering for my faith, and it challenged me, and it grew me, and we had times to pray together and serve together, and it's just this really, really wonderful way to get connected. And so if you have not gone through Rooted, I want to personally invite you uh, to consider that this fall. Um, registration for that will be open in about a month, so you can stay tuned on our social media and website and all that for that. Um, or you can just come talk to me, and we will get you signed up for that. It's going to be a great opportunity. Looking forward to what is ahead for our group's ministry with our life groups, rooted, our adult learning communities on Sunday mornings, and everything that he's going to continue to do. And so we're excited about that and looking forward for what's ahead. And now, Jeff Frazier, everybody. Oh, uh, before Abe comes and talks about financial growth, I, we are kind of growing as a staff in the old-fashioned way. Uh, Joe has, uh, is, is stepping in and bringing leadership to groups uh, under the leadership of and in the absence of Paige Peltier. Paige is on maternity leave, and she has with her Ruthie, her little beautiful baby girl Ruthie right now, so you, you can meet Ruthie later. And also, um, Marcy Campare, who's our director of communications, and Anton had their baby girl. Maybe you didn't hear this yet. They had a baby girl named Juniper Opal. And she is beautiful and healthy. And Jenny is here, and she's pregnant with a baby girl. And Joe's wife, Judy, is pregnant with a baby, probably going to be a girl. There's just babies, girls coming out all over the place. So anyway, uh, Abe, say some things about numbers. All right, on that note. Um, well, thank you guys for hanging in there. I know we're coming up on an hour, and I will uh, try to move quickly. And if you have questions, certainly address those, because this is an important topic as it relates to our, the financial health of our church. I think we've heard a lot about what God is doing here, but what enables uh, a lot of, of that ministry, as you heard, is just the faithful generosity of God's people here. And, and before I put a few numbers up that are uh, certainly much to celebrate and much to be grateful for, I just want to say how, on behalf of the senior leadership team and our entire staff, is how grateful we are and, frankly, how humbled we are at time at the faithful generosity of God's people here. We know we serve a generous uh, God, and we know he calls us to be generous people, but seeing that generosity poured out, seeing that blessing here at, at Chapel Street and what that has enabled us to do um, has just been an ex extraordinarily overwhelming thing during this COVID season. And it's something that we take not only as a privilege, but as a responsibility uh, to steward those resources well, to look for ways that we can most effectively follow God's leading to share his gospel and to expand his kingdom both here locally, but, but around the world as well. So I just want to thank you for that and, and just for that continued generosity and, and support during uh, these challenging times. Uh, so with that, let me uh, just share a few numbers with you uh, real quick. It's one other slide other than the title slide you'll see uh, this week. And there's uh, try to boil this down to just a, a few key metrics for you as we come towards the end of our fiscal year. For those of you who don't know, we uh, conclude our fiscal year at the end of August. These numbers are through our last official month of, uh, of close. So we uh, just closed out June not that long ago. And so we've got uh, this is a 10 months of financial data. Uh, and then with July and August still to go in our fiscal year. 
But as you see, through that time period, uh, giving to our general fund is about $433,000 ahead of our forecasted budget. For those of you who don't know, or kind of just to clarify that, we set an annual budget every year based on uh, the voting of, of our, um, our membership, and we set for this year a budget of $5.2 million to run the operations of the church. And so we take that budget and we spread it out across 12 months of, of giving to allow us to, uh, to plan for that. And so based on that budgeted uh, giving that we anticipated coming in for the uh, $5.2 million, we're a little bit ahead of that. I can tell you while this is through June, the last two weeks of data, uh, the first two weeks of July, have put us just over $5 million. So we will come in, probably hit our $5.2 million in, in general fund giving sometime in the next couple of weeks, uh, with still the month of August to go in our fiscal year. So you see why uh, it's just been an overwhelming and just a testament to God's provision uh, through your faithful generosity during this season. During that same time, our operating expenses, so our, our, our plan on how to spend those funds to administrate the, the church and to do ministry here, were about $177,000 under budget there. Uh, that's partly due to, as I mentioned, just the faithful stewardship of our staff, really looking for how do we best use these funds uh, for the advancement of the kingdom. But also, you know, we planned and budgeted August of last year for this coming year, and obviously with the best of assumptions of when COVID would end and when things would open and how what ministries would start up and when our facilities would be used again. And so some of that is just obviously that uh, was very much a prediction and things have happened slower in some cases and faster in other. And so we've been adjusting our budget along the way. Uh, but the net result of, of those two things is we currently have um, unrestricted funds available to us to operate the church of just over 1.6 or just under 1.7 million dollars, which is approximately four months of our operating expenses. Now, when I say unrestricted funds, this is not just money we have just kind of laying around. These are the funds that we use to operate the church on a monthly basis. So our unrestricted funds are the, are the funds that are given uh, to the church, to the general fund that we use to operate on a day-to-day -day basis, pay our staff, run our ministries, uh, keep the lights on, those type of things. Uh, and you say we've got about a four-month reserve there. That, that's actually a pretty healthy amount. Most uh, organizations would tell you somewhere between three and six months of kind of operating reserve is what you want to keep on hand. And that's obviously we're in that uh, window right now. We, we, we have kind of set through our leadership team and through our finance committee a target of about three and a half months uh, is what we feel is a reasonable amount of kind of reserve to keep on, on a regular basis. So we're working. And actually some of these funds that you see here, while still technically unrestricted, have been allocated for projects that are either underway or about to be underway. You've seen the recent um, paving and resurfacing of our, of our parking lots. We've got some new exterior signage at all of our campus. Uh, you'll notice some of our signage are, are wood signs with canvas strapped over them. So we've got some other signage to help better indicate uh, our different campuses and some other projects that are ongoing to further invest these funds uh, to help expand the kingdom work both here as well as around the world. I will say that total number there you see at the bottom, total giving. So you, when you take the giving not just to our general fund, but giving to also some of our restricted funds like Serve the World, our mission fund, or giving to our Community Compassion Fund or our, our Benevolent Fund, uh, when you take all of those giving uh, together, we, our giving is actually up over last year's giving at just under 4%. So the generosity of this body of of what, we, uh, what you, we've been blessed with and what God has uh, provided for us so that we can continue to, to, pro to move forward with his mission here has just uh, continued to be a blessing, and we see that, that giving up, up overall. So again, uh, if you have questions on this, we'll have a Q&A time if you want to grab me afterwards uh, just to keep um, that going. But I think it's just uh, want to just share with you just the extraordinary uh, uh, blessing that's been upon us and the, and the generosity of this church has enabled. One other slide just to talk real quickly then about our, our debt. Uh, that, we're, um, that we're still carrying or that we're currently working through. I will note, as you've heard and I didn't mention previously, um, of that giving, one, one amount that was not uh, included in that previous slide as far as general fund giving is our giving to our neighborhood church multiplication fund or the fourth campus. This congregation, this body, as, Jeff, as you've heard over the last few weeks when we had the matching gift, uh, gave a combined one, just over $1.8 million to that above and beyond what you saw on that previous slide to enable us to launch the North Aurora campus completely debt-free. And I think that's just a, a great testimony, I think worthy of a, of a camp of appreciation to what God has done here is that we can launch North Aurora campus uh, as a completely debt-free campus um, um, as we go forward with that. This, uh, we see here, are the, the loans that we've currently uh, had on, uh, uh, that we've been carrying over the last few years, the Growing to Serve and Mill Creek uh, Mortgage Loan, which is a combination of, of two uh, loans that were put together a few years ago. You see a balance of that is just under 700000 uh, we've got a, a very favorable rate and term on that loan, and we continue to pay just 
uh, under five thousand a month uh, towards uh, towards that loan. And then the neighborhood impact loan, which was the larger construction loan of actually building the Mill Creek campus, uh, as well as construction projects at each of the other campuses at that time. You see that balance at now just under 1.7 million. Uh, again, we've got favorable terms there. Uh, we on that loan as a finance committee and as a leadership actually are paying above the minimum payment. So our minimum payment on that is just under 15,000. As you see, we're paying uh, roughly 20, uh, almost $28,000 a month towards that loan to allocate some additional resources. Uh, as that's a higher balance, higher interest rate loan, so we're all allocating additional resources to try to bring that down uh, over time and sooner. You see our total debt obligation there of just over 2.3 million when you add those two current balances together. I think of importance though, as, as we talk about uh, the, the uh, existence of the debt and the impact it's having on our ability to operate, uh, you see the total cost of servicing that debt, if we were to pay the required payments uh, for the year would be 239 thousand dollars, which if you look at our uh, general fund giving alone, again, not giving to the other restricted funds or not giving, as I said, to the fourth campus fund, just if you look at the giving to our general fund, which are what we use to operate the church, that, that would be about 4.6% uh, of that giving goes to servicing that debt. Very healthy, a number, frankly, something, again, uh, if you look organizationally at churches and not-for-profits, uh, anything under 10% is considered to be a healthy debt ratio, if you look at that. Quite frankly, most churches are somewhere between 10 and 20% of their annual general fund giving goes to debt service. So the fact that we have that number there, I think, is something that is, we're able to manage well, uh, is able to work well with our giving, and allows us to then use the funds that we have available for actual kingdom work and to advance the gospel, as we said. Now, this is something I know that has, there's a lot of discussion about, of, well, shouldn't we just pay down, you know, use our extra funds and pay down that debt quicker? And that's discussions that we have as an executive council and as our finance committee. Uh, and there's reasons why we've chosen currently to, to take this approach. We believe that uh, we've got favorable terms, and so to continue to pay down those terms and add some additional resources to pay down that larger note quickly allows us the flexibility to keep the reserve, which I showed you earlier, on hand for unexpected needs or for ministry opportunities that might occur versus putting all that towards debt servicing and then finding out we have an opportunity that we then need to go back and borrow money for again that might be at a different, less desirable term or a less favorable rate. So that's currently why we're taking that approach. I know there's different opinions on how best to do that and we continue to evaluate that as terms change and as obviously the world around us and the economies around us are impacted. So we'll continue to monitor that along with the, with the leadership team and the, and the executive council. Um, but that's a, just a quick summary, uh, again, of our financial health and well-being. I think you uh, hopefully share with me just the, the gratefulness of God's provision and, and the enthusiasm for what he's doing through his people here. As I mentioned a moment ago, we will be approaching our annual meeting and our, as we finish our fiscal year. So more information regarding our proposed budget will be coming out uh, in the early weeks of August. Uh, we'll be meeting with the EC over the next couple of weeks to, for their approval of that and then uh, sharing that out with you uh, in advance of that meeting so there'll be time for review, for questions you might have, and for ultimately then uh, the vote on August 22nd at our annual meeting or prior to that via absentee or online. So if you have any questions on that, we'll have a few minutes. Again, I'll be here as well if you want to come up uh, and ask anything specifically. But with that, I'll turn it back over to Pastor Jeff to close us out. Thank you, Abe. I just want to, um, just want to, Abe said it's humbling. I just want to pause and give God great praise for what's been on the screen there, and it doesn't even really tell the whole picture. We, we forget that one year ago, we celebrated uh, paying for and launching Shepherd's Heart debt-free for a million dollars, and now a year later, we're launching a fourth campus debt-free because of the generosity of God's people and his provision, and, and we see uh, uh, budget growth during COVID, and we see we're almost 5% ahead of that again for, the, for this year. It's, it's overwhelmingly humbling to, to think about how, how gracious God has been to us. And I, I feel, we, I want you to know, we feel the burden of stewarding that well. Not just protecting a, a, a nest egg, but re stewarding it for the sake of the gospel and for the kingdom. And so I just want to say thank you. And let's just take a moment and praise God and pray and thank you for what he's done and is doing. God, we just pause. and it, it, Hearing all these stories and hearing what you're doing in our midst and then seeing the way you provide, it's how can we but trust you and move forward in faith where you lead us? Forgive us for being fearful about these things. Give us greater faith we praise you for the way that you provide for our church, 
for our families, for our community. I think what Rusty said at the outset is true, Lord. You're on the move. So help us not to lag behind where you're leading us, nor to run ahead, but to stay in lockstep with your spirit as we, as we trust you and move forward because you, you so clearly are providing all the resources we need to do the work you've called us to do. And we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. So we, we want to just have a few moments now. Um, we, we, until, we said until 1.30, it's 20 minutes, and we may go longer. But if you want to, if you have all the information you need and need to go to brunch, you won't offend me if you leave. But you're welcome to stay, and we're going to have some time for Q&A now. So I'd like to have Rusty come up, and we'll also, if some of the guys here, and, and, and Kristen, others that have spoken or shared, if you have, if a question is asked that you can answer, I'll bring you up and, to answer that. But uh, Joe will be on the roving mic. I'm ready. So anybody have a question you'd like to ask? that we could answer for you of anything that we've covered or not covered. Shar. First of all, I add my thank yous to everything that's been happening these last, this last year and that we felt included and not just hanging out there by ourselves at a strange time, but that we could always come home even mm. though it was a different way. But my question is, um, I haven't heard anything about Word and Table, our very uh. special worship time. It's been very meaningful for some of us. And while well, we're grateful, believe me, for everything that is being offered, yeah. I just wondered what the future could be for that. Uh, great question. And uh, in case you didn't hear, a Word and Table service was a, a small service that we held in our student center at the South Street campus pre-COVID. Um, we have not brought that back. And at the present time, we don't have plans to for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, frankly, leadership of the service, uh, and two, critical mass of the service. Uh, the third reason was initially, I think, Kenton, we talked about this, was that was such a high touch, coming forward, touching the elements during, in the wake of you know, coming out of COVID, just didn't feel like a very safe thing to do. So uh, at, at the present time, we feel, I guess what I'm saying, we feel like that service has kind of run its course and we're taking a different direction. Although I think we'd always be open to any uh, what's best, but I know that may not be the answer some folks who love that want to hear, but it's, it's a decision we've made at this time. Thank you for asking it. Yeah. Yes, Jim. Thanks. Uh, I echo all the thanks as well. Uh, it's just been an amazing journey and appreciate all that everyone's been doing. You know, last year, um, I don't know, maybe it's a year and a half ago, uh, the time frame is all blended, but um, when you were planning for the annual meeting, there were a lot of conversations about big strategic decisions, the fourth campus, um, the food pantry expansion, and so forth. Um, as you look to the August annual meeting, is there some biggie strategic move, or is it all about execution at this point? Great question. You're asking about the fifth campus, aren't you, Jim? No, yeah, yeah. just... Yeah, yeah. What's, what's next? Actually, what you said is really true. It's something I pray about and think about all the time. What's next, God? What's next for us? Where are you pointing us and aiming us? And, I, and I'll answer it, and Rusty, you might, you might want to speak to this as well. We, we, I think the EC, we agree that when we've talked to experts who do multi-site as an organization, they tell you that going from two to three is not, is, is not as difficult as going from three to four. Maybe that's like having children, maybe, right? I don't know. But going from three to four you, is exponentially more difficult in terms of your systems and your processes. And I think this next year, we have some growing pains ahead of us is figuring out how to do this well, be a family of neighborhood churches with four. So we want to learn those lessons well and prepare for what's next. We do not, at this moment, have a location, a site, or a plan in place for a fifth campus. I think uh, we are uh, financially prepared, should God bring that to us, and in leadership-wise, I think we have a plan in place. But at the, at the present time, we don't have a fifth campus uh, um, in, in mind. But uh, I guess I'd say having said that, um, I, I don't want to be just waiting, hoping something magically happens. We're praying about that, looking, having discussions as a leadership team. About, is there anything else you'd add to that? The they don't let me get up here very often, so that's why. Um, what I would add is that the EC and the senior leadership team did get away in May, and we were, we were looking at strategy. We were thinking more long-term and asking these kind of questions of both, what do you do with the facilities that we have across the board? What's God calling us to? What's next? And certainly campus is part of that, but even thinking about Kesslinger or thinking about 
what we have already in our hand, what is God calling us to use in the best way possible? And I, there's, what's exciting is that I, there's a lot of possibilities. Mm -hmm. and, and so we're talking about that. I think a lot of the discussion, as Jeff pointed out, though, was on how do you do these multi-campuses really, really well? Um, just uh, my background more in kind of thinking about launching new business locations. It's, you know, the thing that, as you pointed out, Jeff, as you start to get to a certain point and you can't just expand onto one person's job or one person's focus, things do change. And so we do anticipate a season of learning ahead. We've been learning a lot from Mill Creek. We've been learning a lot about doing three locations. But this next one is, I, we think, is going to be different. And we, we're, we're excited about that. We think the plans coming, are coming together really, really well. But we also want to make sure that we, we don't um, handle that poorly yeah. in some way. So we're, we're, there's a lot of learning ahead. Also, again, we're, we're thinking strategy. We're thinking you know, wild ideas and saying, okay, God, is that really crazy? Or thinking, you know, ideas that are more tactical, like we're just, you know, how do we make these f facilities work really well? So we've talked and prayed about things like, should we start a school? We've talked about things just, just way out there. Should we launch a campus in another part of the, you know, way outside of our region? Should we, we we're not, um, but we also want, we're just laying them before the Lord. God, where would you have us go? And so we've gotten to the point we are because God has, we, we trust in his timing. We haven't been overly aggressive about that. I, we want to continue to do that. So I think what I'm trying to say diplomatically is they're reining me in to trust the timing. <laughs> okay. Any other questions? That's the real job description of Joe. the EC, by the way. If you, <laughs> right, right. Ropes. If you could just make sure that we have questions for Joe that are on this side and on this side, then on this side and then on this side. I just want to see Joe. Yeah, right thank you board. so much for that. Yeah. Thanks, Joe. Uh, probably unfair to ask this question without Pastor Bruce here, but it kind of was triggered by the last question. What can you speak to with regard to missions, local partnerships, and serving, those kinds of things, yeah, uh, especially if, as the year goes ahead? It's a terrific question, and, uh, and we have um, just had a conversation with Pastor Bruce this week about some of those things. As you know, we have an Advent uh, strategic partner for Serve the World every year. We're already planning about who that is. You'll hear more about that uh, and the generosity opportunity there. Bruce is relentless in, in the best uh, uh, best meaning of that term about maintaining these relationships with our partners. Um, I'm excited about opportunities uh, that we'll do, have some international partnerships that are new, uh, and as well as kind of resurrecting ones that maybe went, went um, what's the phrase, dormant during uh, COVID. Um, we are ramping up our partnership and our connection with Wayside Cross, which was, has always been a strategic partner of ours as well. Um, and so I, I, I want to be careful how much I say because we have things still that are in the works, um, but that, that is something that he has been um, done a fantastic job, even during COVID, at maintaining the partnerships we have and thinking and dreaming about what's next. Um, Pastor John Kelly, who came and preached here uh, during COVID, who pastors the, uh, the Chicago West Bible Fellowship in the Austin neighborhood, um, we're having conversations about what the partnership between our congregation and theirs might look like and how we can support them financially, in prayer, and in terms of service. And so uh, I think there's a lot more to come on that. But thanks for asking it, Clark. Anybody else? Preferably on this far end of the room. I was kidding. It's my workout for the week. Yeah. I mean, I was excited about the question about the Ohio State Buckeyes saving your Chicago Bears. Like, okay. right? Do, yes. I mean, if you don't know, some Sterling, and, out here from my Sterling and, and Rusty are from Ohio, and they're very obnoxious about it. But. But we're glad to have Justin Fields in a Bears uniform, I'll say that much. You know, I'll just say this, and this is not something I plan to say, but um, it's not a secret that our nation and our culture is very sociopolitically divided. And I had always felt like our church family, by God's grace, wasn't that way, um, by and large. There were pockets of it. I think God revealed um, during COVID that we're, we have more of that in our church family than we thought we did. I mean, perhaps you've experienced it with church friends and or, or family members and so on. And that's been a huge burden of prayer and, and for me, for many, for all of us. We talk about it a lot and pray about it a lot. And I think God's been so gracious in holding us together. And one of the reasons, even Rusty, as he said in the beginning, just trying to keep coming back to true north, to Christ, to that he's our anchor, he's what unifies us. Which doesn't mean we don't speak to uh, issues of our culture and of our day. The gospel speaks to almost all issues. But... 
the, the most that we're studying, John, Pastor John Bechtel is leading our staff through devotional times uh, in the knowledge of the holy, A.W. Tozer's book. And he says, the most depressing question before the church at any time is always the question of God. Keeping our understanding of who he is clear is the most important thing. And so perhaps you picked up on that uh, as we've gone through the season. But I'm just grateful to all of you that we, we uh, because even though I think God has revealed some ideology, some even quite frankly idolatry in our hearts and some divisiveness that he wants to heal, I've talked to many, many friends who are pastors around the country who it's infinitely worse. They're really, the the evil one is having a field day. So I'm grateful that he's held us together uh, in the midst of what's been a very divisive time. Anything else? Anyone? Anyone? Bueller. Bueller. Anybody know that movie? Can you pray for us? Yeah. No. Okay. Before any more weird references. This is an example of what the EC tries to rein in. You know, but. The Magna Carta. Okay. Well, um, let's just stand together and uh, close our time in prayer. I'm just going to be quiet. Let's just be quiet in our hearts before the Lord for a moment. And you in your heart give him praise and thanks as being a part of this church family. And Lord, now we, we pause and acknowledge and pray for the people you're bringing here. People who are leaving perhaps experiences in churches where they're wounded. Maybe they have no experience whatsoever in church and they're being invited by friends. Maybe they are coming out of COVID and searching and longing for something and wondering if they might find it here. We thank you that you're moving in people's hearts in our community. Give us your eyes to see what you're doing in people's hearts in our neighbors' lives. Use us for your glory. And we acknowledge, God, that you're providing in astounding ways. We often have a mindset of scarcity, but you are a God of abundance. And you're making that clear. We thank you and praise you. And you're a God who's healing And there's a lot of brokenness and woundedness in our hearts and in our nation, in our culture, and in this world. And we ask you, we plead with you, God, that you would heal the racial division and tension in our community, in our own hearts, in this nation. You would heal the political divide, the anger, the vitriol. And you would use us to do it. And we know that Our culture and so many are so misguided, lost, it seems, looking in all the wrong places for answers. And you are a God of truth. And we thank you for your your clear gospel and the truth of your word. We need it now more than ever. And so help us to be people of truth, deeply anchored and committed to your word. That we would trust you, Lord, about what the family is, what a marriage is, what gender is, what sexuality is, what true hope is, what purpose is. And as Andrew pointed out to us, you're a God who makes things grow. Our own hearts, our own lives, your bride, your body, here and around the world. We pray that for your kingdom, not for our own, for your sake, you would grow our congregation and our influence so that people would come to know how good you are. Lord Jesus, we pray these things in your name. Amen. Thanks for taking the time on your Sunday afternoon to be here.